conclusions. We're going to read chapters 11 and 12 in the Lemonade for tonight. All right, here we go. Chapter 11, a total loss. Total loss. Goods so damaged that there's no point in repairing them or they can't be repaired at all. The first cup was an easy sell. The second cup too. It was on the third cup that a little girl, about six years old, said, "You, there's a bug in my drink. Then her brother said, there's one in mine too. Gross, said an older boy on a skateboard. There are like three in mine. I want my money back, man, he said, dumping his lemonade on the ground. The mother of the little girl and boy looked into their cups carefully. I think you need to check your lemonade, honey, she said to Evan. Evan unscrewed the cap and everyone looked in. The surface was swimming with dead bugs, fruit flies, worms, and a soggy brown caterpillar. Oh my goodness, said the mother. The boy started spitting on the ground like he was going to die. The girl started wailing, Mommy, I drank bugs. I have bugs in my tummy. Evan couldn't believe his eyes. How did this happen? Did they crawl in somehow? They couldn't have. He had screwed the lid on tightly. He was sure of it. And anyway, one or two bugs crawling in, maybe. But 50 dead fruit flies and two inchworms and a caterpillar? It just wasn't possible. Evan was burning with embarrassment as everyone looked at him and his buggy lemonade. Frantically, he reached into the cooler and started to scoop out the dead bugs with his hands. Uh, sweetheart, said the mother, you can't sell that lemonade. I'll get them all, said Evan. I'll get every last one out. No, dear, you really can't. You need to dump it out, she said. Evan looked at her like she was crazy. Dump it out? Dump it out? He'd spent $40 of his hard-earned money on that lemonade and another dollar for the cups. He wasn't going to dump it out. I'll do it at home, he said. No, you should do it here, I think. I need to be sure it's all disposed of properly. Evan looked at her. He didn't know her, but he knew her type. Boy, did he know her type. She was the kind of mother who thought she was the mother of the whole world. If you were on a playground and she thought you were playing too rough, she'd tell you. If you were chewing gum in line at the 7-Eleven, she'd say, I hope that's sugarless. Mothers like that never mind just their business or just their kid's business. They thought they had to take care of every kid in the kingdom. It's too heavy for me to dump, he said. I'll take it home and my mom can help. I'll help, she said the busybody mother of the world. All we need to do is tip it a little. She grabbed one handle of the big cooler. Evan had no choice but to grab the other handle. Together they tipped and the lemonade poured out of the top of the cooler. They poured and poured and poured. The lemonade sparkled in the sunlight like a bejeweled waterfall and then disappeared without a trace, soaking into the parched September grass. As the last sluice of lemonade slipped out of the cooler, a slick of mud poured out. Oh my goodness, said the mother. Evan couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe how quickly his victory had been turned to defeat. It was just like the lemonade. It had disappeared into the grass, leaving nothing behind, a total loss. The mother smiled sympathetically as Evan returned her $2. The skateboard dude had already skated off with his refund. There was nothing to do but go home. Evan walked slowly, dragging the wagon with the empty cooler rattling inside. With every step he took, the wagon handle poked him in the rear end. Step poke, step poke. 
he felt like someone was nudging him forward. Avin, mom wants to see you in her office right away. That had been weird. His mom had had no idea what he meant. I didn't call you. I didn't call anyone, she had said. I've been on the computer. Avin, mom wants to see you. He had been coming up the stairs. Jessie had been in the garage. She looked anxious. Right away, she had said. Evan stopped walking. He stared at the empty cooler. Then he started to run. The wagon bounced crazily along on the uneven sidewalk. Twice it tipped over. What did it matter, thought Evan angrily. There's no lemonade to spill. By the time he got home, he had it all figured out. He looked in the kitchen trash and found the three Ziploc bags inside out and sticky with lemonade. He shook the fruit bowl and noticed how few fruit flies flew into the air or took to the air. If he'd had the right materials, he would have dusted the cooler for fingerprints, but there was really no need for that. He knew what he would have found. Jesse was all over this one. That rat! That lousy, stinking rat of a sister, he shouted. He went back to the garage and kicked the wagon. He knocked the cooler to the floor. He tore up his lemonade on wheels sign into a dozen pieces. He was going to lose. She had a hundred dollars, he was sure of it, and he had just 62 left. Tonight, before the fireworks, when they counted their money, she would be the winner and he would be the loser. Winner takes all. Loser gets nothing. It was so unfair. Evan stomped upstairs to his room. He slammed the door so hard it bounced open again. When he went to close it, he was staring across the hallway, straight into Jessie's room. He could see her neatly made bed covered in couche pillows, the poster of Bar Harbor from their trip to Maine this summer, and her night table with Charlotte's Web at the ready. Evan crossed the hall, then paused at Jessie's door. There were rules about not entering. Well, she'd broken the rules first. Even though there wasn't really a rule about fruit flies and lemonade, it was clearly a dirty trick. Evan walked in and went straight to Jessie's desk drawer. There was the fake pack of gum inside the key. Did she really think he didn't know where she hid it? He'd seen her slip the key inside the box when he was passing by on his way to the bathroom. Jessie was smart, but she wasn't very smooth. He'd known for months where the key was hidden. He just hadn't bothered to use it. Until now. It took him a while to find the lockbox. He checked the bureau drawers first and then under Jessie's bed but finally he found it hidden in her closet. Again, not very smooth. Evan carried the key and the lockbox back to his room and sat on the bed. He put the key in the lock and opened the top. Then, the moment of truth, he lifted out the plastic change tray. There were a whole bunch of scraps of paper on top and there was a folded index card too. Evan moved these aside and found a $10 bill paper clipped to a birthday card. Under that was an envelope labeled pre-war earnings with $4.42 inside it. That was the money Jessie had had before the lemonade war began. She'd kept it separate just like she promised. Next to it was a fat envelope labeled lemonade earnings. Evan opened the envelope. Inside, the bills were arranged by ones, fives, and tens. All the bills were facing the same way so that the eyes of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Alexander Hamilton were all looking at Evan as he counted out the cash. $208. There it was, the winning wad. Evan thought of how hard he'd worked that week in the blazing sun, in the scorching heat, he thought about the cooler full of lemonade pouring into the grass. 
He thought about handing over his $62.11 to Jessie and how she'd smile and laugh and tell. Tell everyone that she had won the lemonade war. The guys would all shake their heads. What a loser. Megan would turn away. What a stupid jerk. Evan slammed the lid of the lockbox shut. He stuffed the envelope in his shorts pocket. He was not going to let it happen. He wasn't planning to keep the money, not for good, but he wasn't going to let her have it tonight. When it came time to show their earnings, he'd have $62.11 and she'd have nothing. He'd give her the money back tomorrow or maybe the day after that, but not tonight. He felt he suddenly felt a desperate need to get out of the house as fast as he could. He shoved the lockbox back in Jesse's closet and the key back into the fake pack of gum. Hey, Mom, he shouted, not even waiting for her to answer back. I'm going to the school to see if there's a game, okay? Okay. All right, Evan, let's see what happens next. We're going to go right into Chapter 12 called Waiting Period. Waiting period, a specified delay required by law between taking an action and seeing the results of that action. Jessie wanted to have fun. She really did. But it seemed like the more she tried, the less she had. First, the drive to the beach took two and a half hours because of traffic. Jessie felt the car lurching. Forward, stop. Forward, stop. Memo to myself, said Mr. Moriarty. Never go to the beach on the Sunday of Labor Day weekend, especially when there's been a heat wave for more than a week. In the back seat, Jesse and Megan played license plate tag and magnetic bingo and 20 questions, but by the end of the car ride, Jesse was cramped and bored. Then the beach parking lot was full, so they had to park half a mile away and walk. Then the beach was so crowded that they could hardly find a spot for their blanket. Then Megan said the water was too cold and she just wanted to go in up to her ankles. She kept squealing and running backwards every time a gentle ripple of a wave came her way. What fun was that? Sure, the water was cold. It was the North Shore. It was supposed to be cold. That's why it felt so good on a hot day like this. When Jesse and Evan went to the beach, they would boogie board and body surf and skim board and throw a screaming scrunch ball back and forth the whole time. They loved to stay in the water until their lips turned blue and they couldn't stop shaking. Then they'd roast themselves like weenies on their towels until they were hot and sweating again, and then they'd go right back in. Now that was fun at the beach. Megan liked to build sandcastles and collect shells and play sand tennis and read magazines. That's all fine, thought Jessie, but not going in the water? That's crazy. The ride home was itchy and hot. Jessie had sand in all the places where her skin rubbed together, between her toes, behind her ears, and between the cheeks of her bottom. And somehow she'd gotten sunburned on her back, even though Mrs. Moriarty had smeared her all over with thick, goopy sunscreen twice. Jessie didn't even have the patience for 10 questions, let alone 20. But Megan didn't get that Jessie didn't feel like talking. She kept trying to get her to take a quiz in a teen magazine. If Evan had been there, he would have kept quiet or maybe hummed a little. Jessie liked it when Evan hummed. As they turned onto Damon Road, Megan asked, are you feeling sick? In fact, she was. For the past half hour, Jessie had been imagining walking in the door and facing Evan. And she'd been feeling sicker and sicker with every mile that brought her closer to home. Okay, we're nearly done. I wonder how it's gonna turn out. All right, have a good night, Trojans.